Welcome. Welcome back to our office hour. Today we'll have a physics, at least a science discussion, on discrete nonlinear dynamics. So let me talk to you a bit about this before we get going. Uh, when I first started teaching computational physics, and we first started developing the material for this book, there was very little nonlinear dynamics taught in physics classes. Certainly in the undergraduate curriculum, uh, classical dynamics didn't cover these subjects. So we spent a lot of time developing them here for this book and other books and teaching them. And it was very good. In the meantime, now other courses have picked up on these materials. So the book has quite a bit more on this, even though we'll cover in lecture, more than maybe you, you care to see. Uh, but it's good. You know, It's there for a reason. If you haven't seen it before, then that's a good place to read it. If you have seen it before, then you should try to do something new and different. So. This is one of the success stories, this nonlinear dynamics of computational science. It's a field which really used the computer to get developed, used the computer to make discoveries. Now mathematicians, or applied mathematicians, not even mathematicians, have come back and cleaned up the debris that we left, and they've derived the mathematics of what's going on. But I don't want you to do, do that. And maybe your other courses teach, teach it that way, as an area of applied math with everything written down analytically. I want you to do this as an exercise in experimental computation or experimental mathematics. You know, you're just going to have a mathematical equation and use the computer to explore it, to do an experiment, see what happens. In fact, that's how this stuff was originally done. And it's really a lot of fun and a very good at learning exercise. So let's talk about that. Let's talk about discrete nonlinear dynamics, and bugs. You'll see why we call that bugs. So let's get on. First slide. What's the problem? Well, the problem is, why is nature so complicated? And many of us believe that we like physics because physics was so simple, and the laws of physics are simple. Therefore, we study physics. But let's not worry about real nature. But if you look at real nature, it's very complicated. And it's hard to believe that anything as complicated as insect population, weather patterns, uh, some of the graphs you see here on the slide have something simple happening. This is complicated. There doesn't seem to be any structure. There doesn't seem to be any underlying simplicity here. So study physics is one answer. But no, no, actually. As we'll see, even very complicated behavior could have very simple mathematical model underneath. And that's interesting. So here we have an example of systems that look chaotic. Sometimes they look periodic. Sometimes they look stable, like the weather. You can have five sunny days in a row, and then suddenly rain, sun, sleet, everything, then stable again. So that's the problem. Can a simple discrete model, by discrete we mean not a differential equation of any sort, just plain algebraic equations, can a discrete model produce complicated behavior? Okay. So let's get on. Let's look at the next slide. Now, maybe you don't want to look at the next slide. So we'll use as our model. We can have many models, but let's look at bug populations, both because bugs are simple. You can get hands full of them, and they breed very quickly. So they're easy to study. And you know, sometimes we'll have, we start off with generations. So we start off with generation 0, n0 bugs initially. Then after one generation, we have n1 bugs, n2. We have an infinite series here of bug populations. And you think of the index as generation number. Okay. And so the question is, can there be some simple function of i, the generation number, that tells us from one generation to the next, or to predict any future generation, what the uh, behavior of bugs will be, how many they'll be. Okay, So let's start. We have already have a hint here. We studied spontaneous decay way back when, when we were studying Monte Carlo simulations. And there we dealt with a discrete law. If you remember the, the discrete law, and I gave a big spiel back then about how the discrete law is actually a more proper description of nature than is exponential decay, which is only an approximation when the numbers get large. Okay? So here, too, we know if we have a discrete law, the change in number per unit time 
now per unit time would just be per generation, is equal to minus lambda, some constant times n, the present number. So that law gives us something that resembles exponential decay, e to the minus lambda t, maybe with a constant out front here, n0. But the point is that gives you exponential decay. So we could say, well, bugs hardly ever decay, particularly if you start off with some number and let them breed, they'll, they'll grow. Presumably, they grow something like exponential growth. So if we change in this equation the sign of lambda, we have a model, a discrete model that will, we know that from the mathematics, will give us exponential growth. Okay? So let's do that into the. <coughs> so here we have on slide 14 already what is the next generation of our model. So we're saying that the change in the number of bugs per generation is some constant lambda times the number. Okay, that, that will give us exponential growth. But we don't want exponential growth. We want to think of a population that's realistic. And realistic populations, you know, at least approximately, what you find is you have a bunch of bugs, say, in some environment. They'll grow to some number, maximum, and if they exceed that number, there's just not enough resources available in the environment to keep them going. So that's called the carrying capacity. So either we can call it the max number or n star here. That's the carrying capacity of some environment. So we'd like to build into our model the fact that as the number of bugs approaches some large number, n star, the growth rate should slow down. Okay, So that's good. So what we'll say is, aha, so we're, we have a growth parameter lambda in the equation here. We'll say now that the uh, will take lambda to actually depend somewhat on the number of particles present or the number of bugs present. Okay? So we're saying lambda is approximately some other constant, lambda prime, n star minus n. Now n star is a very big number, and we start off, say, with a small population. So to start off with, should grow exponentially. No question about that. Okay? But then as n sub i gets larger and larger, we'll see modulation in the growth. So here we have an equation. It's called the logistics map. And what it says is the change in the number of bugs per interval is equal to a constant, another constant, lambda prime, some another constant, n star minus the number present times n. Fine. Well, what we have now is called the logistics map because it balances resources against growth and such like that. Uh, and we have n here, right? But we also have an n there. So we have a nonlinear map. You know, for, for practical purposes, when we start off, it's linear because n doesn't have much effect. But ultimately, we'll have nonlinear. And this is the lesson. You know, it's um, nonlinear behavior. And nonlinear mathematics often hasn't been studied, particularly for undergraduates, because it's more complicated and tends not to have analytic solutions. But nonlinear behavior can be much more interesting and much more surprising than linear behavior. And this is, if, you, if this is your first example of it, good. Okay. So what we have then is, if, if, if n is small, we expect exponential growth. But as n gets larger, as n actually approaches n star, this maximum, we would think, OK, if the effect of lambda goes to 0, so the exponential growth should level off, maybe be flat. And if n ever gets larger than n star, it should decay. But once it decays, then the sign changes, it could come back. So we, we might have a very interesting problem. So let's explore this problem. Let's explore this problem. So let's look at the next slide. Take a look at this. So on this next slide, we actually take the equation and write it in dimensionless variables. And you may call them natural variables. But they're at least the, the, the variables that you'll find in most mathematics books. So if you want, it's just algebra. It's just accounting, OK? No, no thought involved. But we have an equation 1 here, the same logistics map, except rather than writing it as the change in population per generation, we write it as the actual population per generation. So we have to add in the delta n. So we have population at generation i plus 1 is the population of the previous generation plus the change. So now we just do some change of variables 
and we'll end up with equation two. So we define a new growth rate, mu, which is one plus lambda prime delta T n star. We'll forget about these numbers in just a second. And we define a new variable, x, which is lambda prime delta T mu over n, so it's proportional to the number. And when n gets, uh, for all practical purposes, since uh, 1 is small here, n star is very big, x you can think of as just the fraction of the maximum population. So at any time, x is just what fraction of maximum we have. Fine. So then this is the logistics map in terms of those natural variables. You do the algebra, that's what it comes out to be. And then you see quite clearly it's saying the new generation is the old generation value, there's the 1, with a correction term which goes like minus x squared. That's all it is. Very simple. Uh, Feigenbaum, a graduate student at NYU, was one of the first to study this, and he studied it on a hand calculator. That's what we want you to do. Okay. So if we look at the values of x, you know, from its definition, x could be as small as 0, which means there's no bugs, all bugs are dead. You may think that's good, but bugs probably don't. Or x can be 1, which is essentially the maximum population. Fine. Okay. This kind of equation, equation 2 here, is called a map. And it takes generation i and maps it into generation i plus 1. Okay. So th this particular map is a quadratic map because it has an x squared term in it. You can have a quartic map, you know, uh, any power of x, that these different maps. So we have a linear and a quadratic term, so it's called a quadratic map. It's a one-dimensional map as well, because there's only one variable, x, in it. You can have maps, discrete maps of this sort, with x and y, then you'd have a two-dimensional map. So let's, we're keeping it very simple. So for our equation here, for the, for the logistic map, the function on the right-hand side, f, is mu x, 1 minus x. And we, we do a little of it in the book. You can actually do some mathematics with f to determine the characteristics of your map. But mainly what I'll show you here is empirical results. Okay. So let's look at the next slide. So what I'm showing you here is what I want you to do as your first exercise. You don't have more than one exercise, which is to say, let's just study what the population x is as a function of i. Make a graph, whatever, and you have to do it for different values of mu. And when you do it, you, s you get four different regimes. And this is just fascinating because it's such a silly, simply, simply silly equation. For mu equal to, well, mu equals 0, you get nothing. But if mu is equal to 2.8, okay, just, just a value from experiment, what you see here is something like slide a. <coughs> We start off with some initial values called the seed. For everything I tell you here, uh, this, the value of the seed doesn't matter, unless it's 0. If it's 0, then it matters. Or if it's 1, it might matter too, because that's the limit, and strange things can happen. But if it's any value in between, and I think usually I start off with 0.75, but you can start off with anything, uh, you get the same result. Not identical, but the same long-term result. And we don't care about the transiency. Again, so we start off initially with some seed, doesn't matter. The system goes through some oscillations, boom. And then it attains a single stable population. So that says, OK, if mu, which is a combination of birth rate, which is like the, the lambda, and then uh, death rate, whatever, to moderate it, breeding, uh, if mu is some value here, we get an equilibrium where as many are being bred as many die off. Fine. If we increase lambda or mu a little bit beyond 3, 3 is a magic number, we end up with a system that starts off and oscillates. This is just in transient motion. And then it falls into a two cycle or two population. So what we have here, of course, is we have a system which is at one level, one time. The next generation, it goes up. Then it comes down and so forth. So it's not stable because it's constantly varying, but there's two populations that it always comes back to. So it's a two level or a two cycle. Okay. If we increase mu just a little bit, 
then we get what we call four cycles. Because we see here, you know, it starts off, forget about the transients, we don't care about that. But then later on, we see there's one, two, three, four levels, and the system just goes back and forth in some pattern before, between those four levels. Each between, because each time it goes from one to another, one to another, but it covers all four. And finally, if we let mu get larger than this, we get what we call chaos. And chaos has a strict mathematical meaning, and we'll talk more about that. But we get this figure here where it looks like maybe there's some repeating here, but it does all kinds of stuff. It's very hard to discern a pattern. All from that simple equation. So this really is going to be your exercise. This is what we want you to, uh, to do yourself. But let's, let's look a little bit more at this and see if we can make some sense. So look at slide 30. And in sl slide 30, we show, again, these are the four types of behavior. This is our map, equation 5. And now we can ask the question, can a map like this give us a one cycle? Or can it give us a two cycle? Or can it give us a three cycle? And you answer that just by doing algebra. So here, for example, I'll do the one cycle for you. If we have a one cycle, what we're saying is if you have generation i, and then you go to generation i plus 1, they should have the same value of x, the same population level. We'll call it x star because it's, it's a fixed point. That's what the star represents here, the fixed value. So we just take equation 5, the logistics map. We have mu x star, 1 minus x star equals x star. Fine. We can solve that. It has two solutions. And lo and behold, one solution is x star is 0. And that's what I was said before. If you start off with no bugs, you'll have no bugs forever. It's stable. You know, it'll, it'll stay there. It's not stable, but it's static. Okay. You, if you call, give a few little bugs, then it's not stable. It grows exponentially. Otherwise, x star is mu minus 1 over mu. So we can actually predict now exactly what value of x this will be. There's the prediction. And it works out, but you can check based on that. Very good. Okay. And we can do the same thing for two cycles. So here we have a calculation. Now let's look at the two cycle point. And, the, and these, these, uh, <coughs> these cycles, limits, these values of x star, are called attractors often because the system is attracted to them. They're not stable points because the system's attracted there, but then it immediately goes away. So that's the general property of nonlinear systems. They have attractors, places where they like to be. They don't necessarily stay there. It's like you coming home for the weekends and being happy to go away. Okay, same thing. You, you always come back to them, but then you leave quickly. So we can do the same kind of algebraic calculation now to get the two cycles. We say that generation i and generation i plus 2 must be the same. Not i plus 1, but i and i plus 2 must be the same. So if we put that into our equation here, we get a calculation. And that, that number must be x star. So x star, x star, x star. We can solve for x star, and we get a very interesting uh, solution. We get a solution which has both two values, if you're interested. And then it has a square root. And so as we see, in order for there to be real solutions, mu must be greater than 3. Aha. Excuse me. So if mu greater than 3 means that until mu gets to a certain level of growth, we we'll, can only have one population. But as the growth gets larger, then we can get real solutions in which there'll be two levels. And we can predict exactly what they are, and these are them. And we predict two, the two levels with the plus and minus sign. Okay. And this is a bifurcation. Bifurcation means to break up into two. And what this says is that just at mu equals to 3, our system can bifurcate. It can take what was one population here, nice and stable, and then suddenly break up into two. And the bifurcation always occurs like that. So here at n equals 3, the yellow graph, what's happening is we have one population. It then breaks up into two. 
and then there's another, you know, one of those breaks up into another. So we're getting always increases of this sort. Okay. So, as I warned you, I want you to do this as an exercise. So, we'll take a little break after this before we get on. While you go into the lab, use your computer, use your calculator. I want you to just do that uh, logistic map on yourself. Convince yourself that has all this behavior. Okay. So first, try to confirm that there's this behavior A, B, C, D. All these cycles occur more or less as said. Okay. And ultimately, when, even when you get very more complicated tools, it's nice to go back and see what's happening. Always a good idea. Okay. What, what occurs in these behaviors? Well, what you should see at transients, that's the initial behavior where the system does various things and then it stops. Okay, then it falls into asymptotes. Okay, and those are those final X star states. That's the asymptotic behavior. That's what you want. Extinction. What does that mean? Well, that means if mu is small, you know, so if mu is approximately zero, the system just dies off. It doesn't keep going. Okay. Stable states, yes. You can get a state which is stable, which is a one cycle. Anything else moves back and forth that's not stable, you get multiple cycles, a four cycle. Then, one of the interesting things is intermittency. Now, I remember from my youth trying to listen to shortwave radios or trying to listen to a radio in a storm pulling in distant stations, and sometimes you get a beautiful signal, and then suddenly it goes away, you hear nothing but static, and then it comes back. Okay, that's called intermittency. It's actually a related nonlinear phenomena. And you'll see that here for mu values between this very particular range. What you'll see there is a system which has very stable behavior. You change it a little bit, becomes unstable, change it a little more, and it comes back to stable. So that's it's an intermittency. It's very complicated. There's no simple way of saying why is it behaving complicated now and so simple just a second ago, except, you know, it's like your children or your family members do that. Well, Let's, I'll stay out of that. But it, it's, it's a behavior, it's a natural system behavior. It's not unusual. Then, chaos. Okay. For mu values close to four, less than four, we have chaos. So let me, what do we mean by chaos? Think of that a second. You know, chaos is just a word. And I'll define it very carefully in the book. But let's say now what we're talking about here when we talk about chaos is deterministic irregularity. The, the word deterministic means that it's completely determinable. It's completely characterized by the mathematics. So there's no surprises here. We can just compute every little detail of chaos. Okay? So we, we know what's going on. We can compute it, but it's so irregular that it's hard to figure out how it's going on. What's going on? Why it comes into simple equations? The other characteristic of chaos is that it, ha it, sh it shows hypersensitivity to the input parameters, to the little details of the model. So for example, when you're in a region which is chaotic, it is so sensitive to the exact value being used for the parameters like mu that the smallest change in mu can lead to very different results. So consequently, we'd say that a chaotic system is non-predictable. Now this, as I've written down here, this is self-contradictory. If it's deterministic, then it's completely predictable. But we're saying it's non-predictable. In practice, we're saying it's non-predictable because it's so sensitive. For example, if we both run the calculation with exactly the same numbers on little different computers, we may get very different results. To show that, I, what I want you to do is to run this logistics map at 4, a value of 4 for mu, and then a value of 4, 1 minus epsilon, where epsilon is as close to machine precision as you can get. And what you should find is the two systems behave identically, at least at first, but wait a while, and then when it starts getting complicated, they have different levels of complication. And that's typical chaos. You can't predict it. Uh, precisely in a universal sense. We can obviously predict it on our computer very well. And this is, of course, 
known as the butterfly effect, where the statement is something like if a butterfly flaps its wings someplace in South America, the weather pattern in North America may change. Because the weather system, in fact, is one of the first places chaos was discovered numerically in models for the weather system. The, uh, the weather system can be chaotic, and if you're close to a region which is chaotic, then a small change of parameters can give very different results. Okay, so take a break now, come back here, uh, do this, and then we'll talk a little bit more about how to analyze what's really going on. Welcome back. I hope you've enjoyed these exercises. Now that you've suffered a little bit with these exercises and gotten into the nitty gritty, I'd like to show you how neat analysis can be of the same problem. So let's go on and look at the next slide, slide 38, in which we do an assessment of these results. And the assessment is known as a bifurcation diagram. And what we really want to do is to concentrate on the attractors. We like to say, OK, here we have a system. We modeled it, and I've had you look at the population. But the population, or the dynamics of the population as a function of time, is not really as interesting as maybe just where they end up. I mean, you know, that's what you know, the farmer wants to know. How many bugs are there going to be this year? You know? Well, we can tell you that, but maybe we can't. But that's, that's interesting. So we want to try to concentrate on the attractors and in the process show you that even though a system may be chaotic, there's simplicity underneath it. Okay. So what we're trying to do now is we want to make a, a graph. And that graph is going to be a graph of the attractors as a function of mu, the growth parameter. So he, that's called a logistics map, bifurcation diagram for the logistics map. And that's what we have here in this diagram. So here we have x star. That's the final population, the static, not static, but one of the, the attractive population as a function of parameter mu, the growth parameter. And we're starting here at mu equals 1. Mu less than 1 would be uh, you know, a, a system which has negative growth, so the bugs just eat each other up and never breed. So this is where we start. And then we plot up to mu equals 4. Mu, at mu equals 4, the system is chaotic. And beyond that, it's just so complicated. It's very hard to understand what's going on. And here in this graph, we have a little blow up of the region from around 3.8, as you'll see, where there's more going on. But let's, let's talk about this graph. How do you make a graph like this? What is it a graph of? Well, we, you make a graph like this by scanning all possible values of seeds, or initial population, and all values of mu. And that that's not what you plot up, but you have to. You, we don't care about what the initial condition was, and we want all possible mu's down here. So we take a scan of them all, and then you start off with one value of x zero mu. Then you let all the transients die, and then this is the interesting part. Then you output that value of mu and that value of x that you have. Now presumably, if you've let the transients die then the system is in one of its final states. It's in one of the attractors. So if you just keep printing out maybe hundreds and hundreds of mu and x values, after you've already waited 200 times, typically, for a transients to die out, then you should just be getting a bunch of values, many of which will be the same, that are, are the cycle, the different cycles for the system. Okay? So ideally, if you're in an n cycle for that particular value of mu and that particular value of x0, then you should be just getting n different values. Of course, on the computer with 13, 14 decimal places, you never really get that. Uh, but we'll talk about that. And you can get close to that shortly. Okay? But that is, of course, what we want to do. We want to scan all possible initial conditions, scan all mu values, scan at mu values is there, and see what the x star values are which is what this is a plot of. Okay. And so what this plot shows here, and we'll see the enlargements in a moment, what this plot shows here is that for starting at mu equals 1 all the way to mu equals 3 here, okay, we just have one population. And according to that equation we derive, the value of x star grows with mu. 
fine. At this point here, at mu at 3, as we said, the square root then has a real value suddenly. Then we get a bifurcation. So there's our bifurcation. And that stays possible until we get mu value, which we can calculate. It's in the book. A little bit larger mu right here, I believe. Then one of these branches bifurcates into two. And then the other one bifurcates. And the system keeps bifurcating and bifurcating. So if we look at this in more detail, and here I've taken that same diagram, and I've just cut out the part at the top, colorized it so you can see it in different ways, and looked at it, enlarged it a bit. And what you can see here is, here is the two cycle on the bottom. And you can see now the uh, bifurcation here, another bifurcation, and then getting complicated. But if you look, each one of these bifurcations, each line seems to go through another bifurcation. This branch here, say on the left, and I'll try to draw it so you follow it, this branch here, for all values of mu, and you know mu is now going up this way, all values of mu, this branch seems to always be here. You can see it, it's carrying out even into chaos, that there's an attractor there. Okay? And that attractor remains. You know, that there's something about that value of mu, you know, that those characteristics which remain for, forever. And we can see that other places as well. We see a very similar pattern here coming across and also remaining. You know? We got that one already. And the more we enlarge this graph, the more we see that both the pattern remains. These bifurcations occur even inside here. You see more bifurcations. You look closer and closer, right there. And this is the limit of what we plotted. But you can see little bifurcations occurring. Notice that you can also see what's known as windows, These, the, what normally would be horizontal lines. These white areas, such as here, have simplicity. So this is like that intermittency we were talking about, where it, the system can behave very complicated. But now if we go to a region such as this, we have one, two, just three cycles. So that's a known as a three-cycle window. Just three populations occur, even though right near, nearby, next door, all hell is breaking loose. You know, right here, for example. You know, if we go closer here, we can see in that window here, we're getting the whole pattern starting off again and again. So you see this is intermittency. We're seeing it here. We're seeing a window, a three-cycle. And now we're also seeing what's known as self-similarity. The fact that this is actually a fractal-like structure, and I know we haven't covered fractals yet. Maybe you have. You've had listened to the other lectures. But when we talk about fractals, we have a system which are always self-similar, which if you magnify them at any scale, they have the same basic geometric relation to, each that, to itself as it had at a other scale. And that's what we're seeing here. So you know, I'm enlarging this. But there's still that same behavior here. This the bifurcation's occurring. They're occurring here. They're occurring there. So uh, let's get back to our regular lecture. So this is the diagram. We want you, the second part of this empirical analysis, we want you to produce a diagram yourself just like this. And uh, how do you do it? So we'll talk about that next. Okay. So here. Here's how you produce a diagram of that sort. But maybe we should take a little break here. Let's get, and some of, one of our students have been, had, had been so interested in diagrams of this sort that as a homework problem, he actually sonified it. He turned it into sound. So what you're going to hear now is we will play a frequency. And each frequency will, have, will be proportional to the value of x star. So as we start off, you hear one frequency. As the growth starts here, the frequency gets higher and higher. Then as we have a bifurcation, you should hear two frequencies, like a chord. And then here where there's three occurring, you'll hear a nice little chord. Then as it goes into chaos, chaotic system, you'll hear sounds like noise. But the noise will be punctuated by these windows. So if we play that system, play it, we have here one frequency increasing. And then we'll hear it bifurcate.
bifurcation, chorus. Then you should hear a chord, nice chord in the middle. There's the chord. And then you're hearing chaos. Okay. So, uh, gee, that was fun. Okay. How do you make a diagram of this sort? Well, there's various ways. If you have sophisticated software, you might be able to vary the intensity of the screen, like a television producer could, but typically we don't have that. So all we can do is vary the point density. So we'll just be putting various points down for each x value and mu value. So it's a graph of x star mu. This is x, y points, OK? But in doing that, you should remember that we're always dealing with finite resolution. I know every year it gets higher and higher, but let's just take you know, a typical 300 dots per inch, OK? DPI, dots per inch. Well, if you have a 10 by 10 graph you're making, 300 dots per inch, that's 10 million points. 10 million is a lot. Okay? 10 million can, can uh, clobber a printer, at least an older one. It can slow down for everybody else in the class, make you a very unpopular fella. It can also overload a uh, graphics program. Maybe not the newer ones, but if you try, as many of you will and should, you try much higher resolution, because in order to see the details in here, you may want to break up this region into very, very fine grids. Beware, you, know, you can get, get gigantic files which uh, can clobber things and often won't tell you any more, or at least you have to be careful what you do with them. So big and more is often a waste here, because if you only have, uh, this, if you only have a few million pixels, having more than a few million points isn't going to help you any. Okay, so typically what I suggest here for you to do is break up the mu values into bins, you know, finite ranges of mu's, so about a thousand bins, which is quite fine. Okay? Cover the range mu equals one to four, which is you know all that you care about. Obviously, you don't need too much for the low values of mu because there's not much action, but it's really mu beyond three or 3.5 or more where all the action is. So that's where you want to concentrate your work. Here's the interesting thing. In order to avoid duplication, because the x star values all should repeat because they're the uh, attractors, but they may not repeat, repeat uh, you know, in the fourth or the fifth or the eighth decimal place. You don't want to worry about that now. You want to be fairly simple. So we want you to print out x star only to three or four decimal places. And I tell you how to do that in the text. One way, a simple way, is to, if your computer language doesn't have that ability, is to just well, multiply your x star value, which is always less than 1, multiply it by, say, 1,000, then convert it to an integer, which throws away all of the decimal part, and then divide by 1,000 again. Okay? So then you'll have a three-decimal three place number. Okay? Remove the duplicates, either with a command or uh, right in part of your program, so that you don't have a lot of wasted file space, and it's much quicker. Then, enlarge different parts of your graph, as we've done here, so you can see the self-similarity. It's quite striking. And make sure to observe the windows. Finally, let me warn you that we've, we've lost students on this project. And we've had students who've gotten started with this, and you don't see them for a week. And nobody does, because they're just so fascinating. We've had students who've printed this up in various colors and used it as Christmas cards. And that's fine, but... Uh, it is doing exploration. It is a big surprise, but you may have other courses to do as well. So, okay. So here's what we've done today. Here's our summary and conclusion. Uh, many people are surprised. What we show with these exercises is that there's often simplicity and even beauty within chaos. Now, some theologians have taken up, discussed this kind of exercise in their sermons because it's a lesson for the whole world. I'm not saying that's true. But it is interesting how much of impact it's had. So our problem, remember that problem? The problem was to say kind of discrete, simple math gives you very complicated behavior, so complicated that you can't tell what's going on. The answer is yes. Okay? No, even uh, very simple systems can lead to very complex behavior. Uh, presumably, this is just a mathematical construct, but it's a model of the real world. And the more and more we model the real world like this, 
more success it's had. Okay? A lot of that success comes from the nonlinearity. That x squared term is what makes this so very interesting. It's a reason why it's so important for us to study nonlinear dynamics and why computational physics has been so important because it gives us the opportunity to do that. Okay. Uh, what we can't talk about here, well, we can, but I just don't want to spend the time and it gets more complicated and some of you will see it in your other classes now. So what we want you to talk about and look about your answers to see and probably read the textbook, remember reading, is the very signals of simplicity within chaos or the signals of chaos or the measures of chaos. People have worked hard on that. So the bifurcation diagram, we've already showed you that. That shows simplicity and beauty even within chaos. One of the uh, things Feigenbaum did, his grad student, when he first studied the logistic map on a calculator, was to show that the, there's actually some universal characteristics of all second order maps, which this one shows, is how these things bifurcate. He could de you could derive some uh, equations, simple constants, relating the bifurcations, and they seem to be true universally for all maps of second order. Okay, that's a big surprise. It's a very important discovery. Lyupinov coefficients, when a system becomes chaotic, that means it moves away exponentially fast from the attractor. Well, you can measure the coefficients of that exponential growth or decay. Those are the Lyupinov coefficients. Tells you how many different attractors it's moving to, and fat, whether it's coming back or away. That's another measure of energy. Shannon entropy. Again, another measure of chaos. When we have chaos, the entropy increases. The disorder appears to increase. Shannon worked with uh, information in signal processing. So again, very critical for if you have static and noise to understand signals. Finally, fractal dimensions. We'll talk about that shortly. It's a simple subject, beautiful. But if you can deduce the fractal dimension of a bifurcation diagram, it's another way of showing, oh, yes, there's both complexity and simplicity present, and also there's self-similarity, because we know fractals are self-similar. So some of this is for you to work on. Some of this is for you to read about. Some of this we'll see again later. So go to the lab, finish the exercises, and then after this, we'll see how much of this nonlinear behavior takes over, carries over, when we go to ordinary differential equations, and they have similar behavior. But work on this now. We'll get to that another time. Bye-bye.